what what did you oh before you just used the built in so it already had yeah it has some support no but I mean when you did the uh, failure recovery yeah there you were using all the already uh, yeah. built in uh, accelerometer so you didn't have to think about it yeah so now so what did you shoot with the animal port? Yeah. Uh, I started broadcasting yeah. to you. Yeah. Was that that yeah. 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 This, this is just the I'll just turn them off here. Broken champagne bottle. Right. So, what rate can that's not very bad. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, sorry. Did you get my email? No. That's all I do. Sorry. I'll just ask for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming here at this hour. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Morgan for his PhD defense. Um, it's contrary to say a couple of words. I won't say much, although anybody who knows Morgan knows he's an absolute fan of anything to do with science fiction. <laughs> and in fact, um, I sometimes think the reason he wound up in my lab is because all of our computers are named after Star Wars characters. Look <laughs> at the latest one that you just set up, which is called um, Takadana. Takadana, which I had to look up, and I discovered that the thing was supposed to be like the last outpost of civilization, which you can see in Morgan's corner of the lab, and that was quite appropriate. <laughs> Morgan's, um, one of his favorite contributions recently was when, of course, he was terribly excited when the new Star Wars was about to come out, and he discovered to his dismay that some of the youngest members of the lab had never seen the original Star Wars. So, he organized a remedial Star Wars marathon, and I was going to volunteer. Oh, wait, can I have a couple? But then when he started talking about, well, now for the first one, what we really want is the digitally, the second digitally remastered uh, director's cut. And for the third one, you know, and then I was totally out of my league. And I just shut up. And that's my point to take over. That's what I'll do again. Okay. We'll see. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I hope that you enjoy uh, the presentation. We're going to kind of take a trip into the weird imaginable world of small robots. And um, this is something I've been working on for the last five years. I published uh, a series of papers. There's some interest in this in the external community. Um, in my thesis, I've listed some contributions. I'm not going to make you read these on the slide, but um, I'll go through the three that I'm going to talk about most today in context of an outline for the rest of the talk. So um, the context for the robots that I've been building and for um, this talk uh, in general often comes back to uh, the matter of size. So we're dealing with small robots, and that has implications for how they move and how they behave and how they interact with the food environment, how they interact with the ground environment. And so we're going to start with talking a little bit about that scaling context and set up how that's going to come back throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, next, we're going to talk about a robot that is primarily a service robot, but that can leap into the air and become airborne um, and can interact with the food environment. Um, and this is going to be the jump lighting project, and it will lead to the first contribution we're going to talk about today, which was we developed a uh, framework for thinking about this behavior that uh, we were studying and trying to build robots to do. Um, we were able to predict uh, kind of the costs and the benefits of the strategy. Um, next, we're going to talk about robots that are mainly aerial creatures, but that have the ability to come home to roost uh, and uh, can increase their mission life uh, by doing something interesting in an elevated position that doesn't require the power of hovering. 
Um, and that will we'll particularly look at the detail in detail of this transition here, where we're going from being in the sky, being on the surface, and uh, in particular, oh great, oh, there's uh, here's some more handouts. And in particular, we'll talk about how uh, we'll kind of do an in-depth look uh, at how the scale of the quantum order of ability to do this particular maneuver. And that turns out to be pretty interesting. Um, and then we'll talk about a robot that's actually a creature of both worlds that can be in the sky and fly around, that can also actively climb on the surface and come along uh, in a climbing uh, mode. And we'll talk about the, the perfect strategy that we came up with and, the, uh, and how we're able to use that to make this robot that could operate as both regions have both of these local touring modes. So, um, and then at the end, we'll kind of climb on top of this wall and look over and see what's coming down from it. Uh, first thing to sort of set the scale in terms of uh, where we are getting smaller. So processors and actuators and sensors have all gotten smaller over the years, and they've incorporated the commercial product, products. And this has meant that uh, because people want to buy really tiny quad motors, we get access to tiny motors that are optimized and are expensive. Um, and that allows us to build robots that are smaller and smaller, and it's easier and easier to do so. And that's nice because small uh, requires less material to build and can be lower cost. Um, and so that you can theoretically make a device that's interesting and has interesting behaviors, but that doesn't cost as much as something that was the size of a person or a group. So my research has been about taking something small and then adding the mobile bit. So if you have something that's interesting that has, that you think you can see the world and act on the world, uh, then you really want to move it around. So if you, maybe, if you can move it around efficiently, then you can go and search a distant environment, or you can set up a monitoring uh, for the, for some place you are interested in. Uh, you can even set up a temporary communication network. And this is all something that requires mobility in order to achieve. You have to move around in, in the real world and get to interesting places uh, with speed efficiency. And if, of course, since they're small, then you can do that in parallel. You can make multiple have teams of robust doing these things, which is kind of the underlying application for this research. So small robots don't live in the same world we do. And that's just a simple result of geometry. When you scale something down by a half of the length scale, you only get a quarter of the surface area and an eighth of the volume. Since some physical properties depend on surface area, some physical properties depend on volume, the ratio of those physical properties change. And that presents challenges for small robots and also presents opportunities for them to do things that we wouldn't think would make sense at our scale, but that are appropriate for a small robot. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about some challenges. Uh, small robots um, have problems when it comes to, like these little leg and rolling robots have problems when it comes to obstacles. Uh, they can't, um, once, uh, for a given obstacle field as your size increases, the likelihood that you'll find something you can't step or roll over increases. And then for, for the flying vehicles, the principal limitation of scale that I'm going to talk about is flight time. This is results from two things. Uh, partially Reynolds number, the ratio of inertial forces to uh, drag forces gets worse as you get smaller. And then also, as we get smaller, we tend to practically have to move to more power sources like batteries instead of gasoline, which significantly reduces that time in the same year. So the solutions we're going to talk about today, uh, as I said already, are um, this jump glider, which allows us to traverse larger and uh, longer obstacles than we would otherwise be able to. Um, perching, which allows us to maintain an elevated position and have some kind of sensing uh, going on, doing something interesting without using a lot of power, and then extending that to perching and climbing, where we can not only get to a surface, but move around on it. So I'm going to put these now, just for the rest of the paper, we'll come back to uh, some issues of scaling that all three of these deal with. And I'm going to put them in context of the outline here to talk about where we're going to talk about scaling. So throughout, we'll, uh, we'll start with a little introductory uh, note on jumping, which is pretty well established, but we'll sort of set up how we do this analysis. Um, then we'll talk about some scaling laws that involve gliding. Um, we're going to do a deep dive into the physics of how perching scales. And then we'll talk just a little bit about some advantages that small size frames could find. So first, let's start with jumping. Um, so the energy you need to jump over an obstacle scales as your mass. If you want to go a certain height, then gh you need to scale to l cubed. The amount of energy you have, if you're an animal, say, uh, scales as your muscle mass. And 
so if you have a fixed ratio of muscle mass to body mass, then you can expect that your jump height should be constant. Right? So even regardless of whether you're uh, a human or a locust, you should be able to jump about to be high. And that, also, that turns out to be true because of the scaling law. And as you get way, way down, so this is four orders of magnitude between the locust and the human, and they're still jumping about 60 centimeters high, which is interesting. But as you get down farther, you do notice a little bit of a drop off because of because drag comes more important to the people to flee relative to their mass. But it's still all the same ballpark over any order of magnitude, which is interesting. Okay, come here. What about gazelles? I mean, there are animals that exceed that. Yes, definitely. And so there are animals that are optimized for jumping. Right? Jumping is not what humans are best at. Right? But they, uh, so the, the gazelle in particular, or the kangaroo, are the jumpers that optimize for jumping and for storing that energy and spring energy and going again. And that's probably also a slightly different strategy than the way the person is. We don't have a lot of plastic energy storage after jumping. But as far as that's part of that, so there are there's variations to the broad scaling model. That's true. No, we're not talking about two orders of magnitude. For instance, Michael Jordan can jump about four feet high. And, uh, a, good, a good gazelle, I think, is jumping something like maybe eight feet. I don't know. But uh, that's, it's, not, uh, it's not, not 40 feet. So, um, so this basically means that your smaller jumping becomes more attractive to the over obstacles because your ability to get over the obstacles by just stepping over them has gone down, but your ability to leap over the obstacles has remained roughly constant. So this is attractive for small robots who are in obstacle fields. Um, and the next step we want to take is to look at how maybe we can add gliding to this and how that is affected by scale. Um, so we can ask the question that if you want to have meaningful interactions with the fluid environment, uh, how much wing mass, extra wing mass do you need to carry around? So if you're primarily a jumping robot and you need to, you want to carry around a wing in case you want to do something interesting with the air, how much does that wing make away? Well, the lift that you get out of the wing scales with uh, density of the air, uh, the velocity that you're going at, um, which is what we for jumpers, and uh, some details of your aerodynamics, your airflow design. Uh, but it also scales with, primarily what I want to talk about is it scales with your wing area. Your mass scales with your volume, obviously. So this means that as you get smaller, since area is length squared and volume is length cubed, um, the ratio of mass that you need in order to get a certain amount of lift uh, it's better as it gets smaller. So you basically, uh, you have a larger wing area that doesn't cost you as much weight as you get smaller. And this just shows up in nature, so uh, flying fish and frogs uh, exploit this. This frog only has to carry a little bit of extra skin in between its fingers, and uh, it doesn't really impede it while it's going around and hopping and jumping, climbing through the trees, but then when it leaps out of the air, it just extends and adds enough to get a, a significant aerodynamic benefit where it can now go as far as forward as it falls. Um, and this isn't really flying. We call them flying fish, but they are definitely not power flight. This is more leaping into the air and then gliding. So this is what the term we're going to call this behavior from now on, is jump fighting. <coughs> so we're moving to jump fighting now. Why would we want to jump fight? Uh, there's a couple reasons. One, is we think that maybe if we could extend this into a fly, we basically, as you jump, you, you get a lot of energy, and then you basically turn it all into uh, velocity downwards, which just dissipates when you go to the ground. If you use a fly instead, you can turn that energy into some kind of a slope that brings you farther. That makes your locomotion more efficient, and it also means you can go over large obstacles and larger gaps than you'll be able to if you're just jumping. So we're going to use a metric called the cost of transport to try and evaluate how far we go on the jump. It's a measure of how much how distance, how much distance you travel um, versus how much energy it took you to do that, and it measures the efficiency of the motion. And the, right, the metric we're going to use is a drag-free, ideal, vacuum, ballistic jumper that doesn't have to carry around extra weight of the weight. We're going to see if we can meet that metric. And the cost of transport for a drag-free ballistic jumper is half. So simplest approximation that you can make, which is very physical, but which kind of serves as the kind of the starting point for how we thought about this problem, was that say you just jump like a regular ballistic jumper, and then somehow match at the top, you transition to this to a stable flight slope. Um, so this is obviously not how physics works, but it gives us a sense of how uh, that if you have some reasonable flight slope, you can expect to leave the ballistic trajectory. 
And if your ballistic trajectory is bigger, because you don't have any wing mass, so you can jump a little higher and go farther, then you just need a slightly better ballistic drag ratio and maybe catch up with it. So we wanted to examine this in more detail. It's something that actually had, uh, that looked like it might actually be a real behavior and looked like the sharp step transition. And so um, we built, we had an idea for how we could do this, which was that we could, you could make a jumping robot and then strap it to a wing and the, the interface would be a pin joint. And the way that this would enable us to kind of fulfill the mission of jump gliding would be that you would start with this jumper, which, go back, it's basically a, it's a little, it's a little motor here that winds up in enormous carbon, two carbon sticks. You bend them and then they sort of energy and release them and into the air. So you start with that and then you leap into the air and now because your wing is attached to your body via a pin joint, it aligns passively with the airflow on the way up. So this preserves the idea of being a ballistic jumper on the way up because the wing's not doing anything, it's just aligning with the airflow. But then once you get to the top, the, air, the velocity vector brings you up to a hard stop and now you're a little bit easier than that service you can fly. And then you go down to the landing point, probably you go farther than you would if you just jump ballistically. So we simulated this by uh, a two rich body, um, two rich bodies linked by a pin joint, constrained to move in two dimensions, uh, and we simulated uh, enough forces that we thought we would get a good approximation of what was going on physically. So we used the flat plate model to simulate lift and drag on the wing, lift and drag on the elevator, and drag on the airframe. And then we also added gravity acting on the wing, gravity acting on the airplane, and a little bit of frictional torque at the pin joint just to see if that mattered or not. And we ended up getting uh, this kind of result from our simulation, which is nice to have that sharp step change that South Florida looks like it might actually be a real behavior. And it also, for a flight ratio, I think this one is a flight ratio of five, showed that we predicted we'd be able to beat a ballistic jumper. So then we actually built the thing, and this is what it looks like when you. And here's an image sequence of what we just saw. So you see it we took the air, the wings passively aligned with the airplane, and the top it goes into place, and we suddenly have this nice tree line down here. And that we can compare it to the results of our model. So here's the image sequence we just saw, and these dots right here. And then this line is what the model predicted should happen. And it's actually well, and we can tune we can tune the elevator angle to even capture uh, runs that weren't as perfect as that one. So if we had the elevator angle interact the trend, we would have a dive behavior or a stall behavior, and we can capture that by the dynamic model as well, uh, get a good match, which uh, makes us feel confident that the dynamic model was saying something real physically, which is interesting to us because then we did a bunch of simulations of different launch angles. We found that we actually the dynamic model predicted performance gains at jumping at slightly higher than 45 degrees. It was interesting to us, and uh, we wanted something that would give us some intuition for why that was. So the Dynamic model could tell us things, but we had to do full simulations in order to get the answers out. And the first approximation, where it's just ballistic and then flies up, tells us nothing about uh, what the effect of velocity is, what the effect of uh, the initial angle is, what the effect of the initial jump height is. And so we wanted something that was compact and analytic, but that uh, gave us some insight into the real physics. So to do this, we decided to make uh, to get rid of most of the complexity, but just have to inject a little bit of them. So we start with pure ballistic trajectory, and then here we are going to try and find some reasonable approximation of the flat plate dynamics uh, to give us a sense of when we're going to transition from, um, from ballistic to uh, stable Y. And then we'll just, once we're in the some, we'll just use a uh, simple linear equation right to run. So we're going to use, we're going to look at the, initial, the effect of the initial velocity, the effect of the initial angle, and the distance and height between where you start and where you land. See how that affects the performance. So in the ballistic phase, um, it's just Newton, uh, you know, uh, apple on head, ballistic phase. The transition <laughs> phase um, is more interesting. So we're going to say that to approximate the transition phase, we're just going to say that you uh, you continue along the ballistic trajectory until the tangent matches the final y slope. The tricky part here is that um, the final body slope depends on the velocity. And so since the velocity is changing during this transition, um, the physics get a little bit messy. And we found that there the full flat plate dynamics, we couldn't find a, a compact analytic representation that captured all of them. But uh, in order to get something that we could work with, we um, linearized 
uh, we were able to find, it's easy to find that analytic representation if you use a small angle approximation for the peak lift to drag ratio and the velocity at that lift to drag ratio. So then we just drew a point between the peak lift to drag and zero where you start. And so we made a linear approximation of forward velocity versus final velocity. Once you do that, you can get a, some, a simple mathematical expression that gives you uh, the final flight slope, and then you can calculate how far you have to fall in order to get to that flight slope. Then flight makes it simple. We just add up all the changes in height that we had for the, for the other change for the other phases, and we multiply them by our final flight slope. And we can compare this to the results of the dynamic model. So here's just a ballistic trajectory model. Here's the dynamic model, and here's the simplified model we created. We can see that it's uh, it's more intuitive, it's more informative than the ballistic model. We are hopeful that it will give us some insight. So let's actually look at what the terms end up being. So this is the final equation we get. The first term is from ballistics. This says that you should jump 45 degrees if you're shooting your cannon, right? The second term um, I'm going to skip because it gets more and more important the worse your glide slope is. But we weren't trying. We're going to try and have good glide slopes. And for good glide slopes, it turns out being relatively small. So the next term we're interested in is here, which is highly dependent on velocity, and it says that you should jump at a little bit higher than 45 degrees. This is basically trying to tell us that, given what we've inputted, the uh, jump glider would prefer to have a little bit more height and a little bit worse flying slope to enjoy that height in, than uh, an exact equal mix of height and velocity. And then the last term here is function of delta h, which basically just says that if you're up very high, there's no point in jumping up any higher. You should just maximize your flight slope. You're already very high, so you should just jump straight out and get the best possible flight slope so that you can go as far as possible. And then the parameter we want to minimize in the denominator here is a function of our airfoil design. Um, we want to minimize this parasitic drag, CD0. And this gets harder and harder to do as the airplane gets smaller, so there is kind of a sweet spot for jump gliding, where we're big enough to, or small enough to enjoy a nice wing area to mass ratio, but we're, we're small enough where we're not overwhelmed by our own parasitic drag. And then there's, right, I said so we have to minimize this weight to wing area ratio, which kind of harkens back to that first scale law we, uh, scale law we talked about, which is this ratio automatically gets better as you get smaller in size. All right, so we talked about jump lighting. We talked about an experimentally verified uh, framework for predicting how jump lighting effects uh, can produce gains in, in cost of transport. Now we're going to talk about uh, perching. This came up because quadrotors run out of battery, but there's a lot of missions for quadrotor that say, like, just to survey an area or to monitor something where you could perform function as long as it was elevated, but doesn't necessarily have to be hovering in time to be actually flying. In that case, you could make a mission life that was much, much longer if you could perch somewhere. And we picked geometrically simple targets to perch on. So a tree is an uh, interesting target service, and it's much more difficult um, to handle in terms of your controls trying to get into it. Um, and even with a uh, nice motion capture system, this is a difficult geometry. And we wanted to eventually move off of motion capture systems. And so we chose large homogeneous services like walls, like walls and windows to perch on. Um, and sometimes these are the only services that they, these services sometimes make the most sense in some situations. So, for instance, after an earthquake, you've got a lot of debris on the ground, there's not really a lot of good places to land, but these vertical services don't accumulate debris and they actually are fairly really clear. So, it's often uh, a pretty consistent place to find a place to land. So, the one caveat to that is that you can't use a wrap grass to engage a big flat surface like that, so we have to use some kind of uh, adhesive. Uh, but again, scale helps us out a little bit in that adhesive scales with surface area and mass scales with volume. So we get a little bit better in the same as we get smaller. Uh, the adhesives we use for the two robots, for the three robots we're talking about here, are uh, for smooth surfaces, we use a gecko inspired dry adhesive, uh, which works by you pull it and it changes its surface area, and as it changes its surface area, it gets sticky. Um, and the other one we use is uh, uh, microspines, which are little hooks that find bumps and pits on the surface to engage with. Um, we're not going to go into much detail on those, but they, they're both directional. They stick when they are pulled, and they release when you push them. And so we took these adhesives, and for the first task, we took these dry adhesives and about tried to make a quadrant that could stick on glass. Um, and we ended up doing uh, a lot of different mechanism design to absorb the energy and to load the adhesives correctly 
and basically did what I call spaghetti research, which is we knew that we were done when it threw it the wall and stuck. And um, so this is how we threw it at the wall. We put the wall on, toss it at the wall, put it over again, measure it on a high camera and see what we got. And we're able to sort of define that there was a, an envelope of initial conditions where we were confident that our mechanisms were working. Um, that uh, if you come in with so much horizontal velocity and so much vertical velocity, we expect that inside this region you will have a high probability of success. This is good for us to understand our mechanism. It's also good for us to communicate with our collaborators. Uh, so we went over to labs that have these really nice motion capture systems and we've been flying three quad rotors. And we uh, gave them a landing envelope and told them you should fly a quad rotor to hit this, this window at a certain velocity and it would spin. And so then they were able to do that. And this was hard to do. Uh, it turned out to be a pretty tricky maneuver, which is why we have this half million dollar motion capture system in the room. Um, but when you have half million dollars in motion capture system and releasable adhesives, you can also do that. Which they were excited about at the time. <laughs> um, and what we noticed, though, in collaborating with the University of Pennsylvania and Maryland was that uh, there was a difference in. That they were using two different sizes of quad rotors. We noticed that it seemed that the control strategy for a smaller quad rotor was simpler. And this started us thinking about, well, is there some kind of scaling logic behind that? How does this maneuver where we have a gripper on the bottom of the robot, which is nice if you want to pick something up. And then we have to, the, but that means that we have to kind of rotate up and pitch up and come to the surface. How does that, how does that scale the size? So to answer that question, we're going to look at how hovering thrust scales. So we're going to assume that you design robots that supports the robot in here. So hovering thrust scales is L cube, and that means that your thrust to weight ratio should be constant across length scales. So that's our kind of underlying assumption for this analysis. So if thrust goes as L cubed and your moment arm goes as L, then we expect that your torque should go as L to the fourth. And if your mass out here goes as L cubed and your moment arm squared goes as L squared, then we expect that the inertia should go as L to the fifth. This basically means that as you get larger, you have less torque ability to, to generate large angular accelerations. It's harder for a large quadrature to rotate quickly. And that's interesting um, because there's inherently some rotation effects in this purchasing of this strategy. And um, I'm going to actually talk about this, we're going to talk about it in the framework of takeoff, because if you look at these, you start in a stable hover, and then you end up with zero velocity and zero angular velocity. That's a, pre, that's a perfect mirror of uh, starting at zero angular velocity and ending up in a stable hover. So, uh, encryption is a little bit, usually you want to come with a little bit of positive velocity, but they're very similar physics, and for the scaling arguments, uh, they end up being the same. So, um, it turns out to be a little bit easier to talk about takeoff, so that's where I'm going to start with a little easier intuitively right around it. So, if you're going to really start like this, there's going to be a period of time where your component of your thrust in the normal direction is insufficient to beat your weight. And so you're going to definitely be falling during this time. If your thrust weight is constant, you have to rotate some fixed angle, regardless of how big you are, before your thrust is going to match gravity. And so, regardless of how big you are, you're going to have to rotate some fixed angle before you can start decelerating. If you're going to accumulate some velocity during this time, you're going to fall, you're going to need to dissipate that velocity, so there's going to be some distance that you're going to fall. And since falling is intrinsic to this maneuver, and because falling distance involves this rotation, and rotation is harder to get bigger, this might have a scaling consequence. In other words, if this scales the size, then it's possible that bigger quad motors need higher windows in order to stick on. So let's take a look at that. So we'll look mostly at these two stages. We're, we're not going to look at minimizing. Uh, so if you start coming off the wall, your rotors are going this way for a long time, so you're going to have to accumulate some velocity this way. You'll have to be to get rid of that. We're not going to talk about that, we're just going to talk about the minimum falling distance. So, this falling state, uh, if you want to get out of this falling state as quickly as possible, you have to use your maximum angular acceleration. This is torque is L to fourth, the inertia is L to fifth. The alpha, your maximum angular acceleration, scales as torque over inertia, or one over L. So, your maximum angular acceleration decreases as you get bigger by one over L. Now, the amount of time you're going to spend doing this maneuver is um, a function. If you want to get out of this maneuver as quickly as possible, then you need to use your maximum acceleration to move through some angular displacement. If you use maximum angular acceleration, it's going to take some time. You can't go faster than maximum angular acceleration. So the minimum amount of time it's going to take you to rotate through this 
integer is going to be proportional to the square root of 2 over alpha. And since alpha is 1 over L, this means that the time is going to go to the square root of alpha. And that means it increases with size. So you're going to accumulate some velocity during that time. That velocity is going to be a function of the time and of the acceleration. Now the acceleration is going to be some of the forces on mass on your mass. And the sub forces in this case are thrust times the angle minus gravity. And if you drive through by mass, you see that it's a function of thrust to weight, which it says constant over length scales. Theta, which for regardless of your size, you're going to go through the same angles. This is also constant. And gravity, which is constant for length scales. So the acceleration you experience should be constant regardless of how big you are, which means that the velocity you accumulate is just a function of the time spent falling. And since time is going to square now, velocity will also scale to square now. So the minimum distance is accelerating. Now you can accumulate this velocity, you have to get rid of it. The, the fastest way you can possibly get rid of velocity is to be pointed in the right direction and operating at maximum thrust. And the way that scales is again, thrust mass minus gravity, which is also constant cross length scales. So then you can just do constant acceleration, how much distance do you need to get rid of so much velocity at constant acceleration? That's a simple formula. It ends up being a d squared term. So it's a square root of L squared, which means that we expect the distance you fall should scale as L. So this means that for a larger quad rotor, you're going to need a, a higher place to perch in proportion to how, how long you're, to a characteristic length scale of the quad rotor. Which is an interesting result. And we wanted to try and validate that a little bit. Uh, so we, we made a dynamic simulation uh, where we had, you have two sets of rotors, uh, one here and one here. We model the distance point applications of thrust on our body. Uh, we iterate over the control inputs and um, we find the minimum falling distance for uh, four sizes of quad rotors, uh, ranging over one and one half to size. So the equations here are you have an angular acceleration as a function of the two thrust inputs. You have, you then if you assume that angular, if the thrust inputs are constant over a short amount of time, then you can integrate up to get the angular displacement as a function of time, and then you can plug that into your equation for uh, acceleration in the y direction, which is a function of the thrust inputs in your angle. And then you can uh, numerically integrate that a couple of times to get the velocity in the position. And assuming that, of course, we did uh, some very coarse thrust inputs first, and then we went fire and fire until we found the minimum volume distance. And it ended up being that the, the consistently across length scales, the strategy that ended up following the least distance was you first, for the first few uh, milliseconds, you apply a very strong torque, the strongest torque you can possibly apply, and build an angular velocity. But as soon as you have enough angular velocity, you turn both orders on at maximum. And the goal here is to stop falling right as you come to one. This ended up being the strategy that got us to stop falling in the distance. And so these are some of those uh, trajectories that we ended up simulating for the different uh, sizes of quad rotors. You can see that the smaller ones don't build up as much velocity and therefore they don't fall as far. And how does this compare to our analytic prediction? Well, we predicted that it would scale as L, which is M to the one third, and that's not just this dotted line. And here's the actual uh, numeric simulation results. So that scales very well. This was exciting because now we could have. Maybe we thought if we could scale down even farther to even smaller than our Maryland quad rotor to this little crazy fly, then we could do uh, perching instead of in a room that was bigger than this room, we could do it at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, we could do it on my desk at Sanford. So here's that. And it works. Um, and sticks, which was, and we were able to take this and do other interesting things like failure recovery. And we're all enabled by the fact that it's, you require less space to do this maneuver when you're smaller. So that's our contribution for this section. We're talking about the scaling analysis that helps understand how to, how to perch uh, in smaller spaces. Um, and now we're going to talk about an extension of that, which is we still weren't satisfied with our perching strategy. We wanted to do something that was a little more personal. So we uh, moved on to scan. Um, so the big challenge for us is that we want to perch reliably outside without the age of native motion capture system. And even though a smaller quadrator is easier to do this with, it was still really difficult. Um, and it was it was open loop, but it wouldn't work. It was it was difficult to tune it exactly to work correctly. Right. Um, and we also, even in the best case, when you come up to perch like this, the rotors are pointing away from the wall, and they're 
the gravity is pulling you down, so you lose, you basically lose your ability to control the perch as you come close to the perch. Um, you, the only thing you can really do with your motors is a port. And so, uh, this got us thinking about the stability of the contact caps through the shear engagement wall. So when we were rotating up like this, we would hit with an outrigger that was supposed to help us align and act as a pivot point. But it would only act as a stable pivot point while it was actually accelerating us. During that time, it would act, we could, we could have an aligning torque from gravity. So gravity would try and pull us towards the wall, line up with the wall. Um, but that effect of gravity got smaller and smaller the closer we got to our desired position. Whereas the effect of thrust, which is trying to move us away from the wall, remained constant. So this actually did, ended up being fairly unstable, which is why it was so hard to control and had to use uh, Vicon to do it. But flip that on its head, now you come to the wall and you have words pointing towards the wall, suddenly you get a much more stable physical situation. So you have a nice stable contact point here because you're pressing into the wall, and then your torque, this is the thing that's acting to bring you into the wall, that remains constant, in fact actually increases due to ground effects, while your gravity torque that's trying to pull you away from the wall gets smaller and smaller as you come close to the wall, there's more and more aligning the body front. So this led us to a new strategy, which was partly enabled by the fact we noticed that our tiny plotters didn't break because we were headfirst into the wall. So we got a little more brave, and we decided to fly headfirst into the wall. And so this ended up, uh, this is, now we're able to go outside, uh, this RC control, this is how. Um, we're just controlling roll pitch out for us. There's nothing special about uh, the onboard electronics. Um, and we fly into the wall, and and it'll show the game in slow motion. Come in, this is our pivot point in the intersection of the wall, and then our loaders just slide this right in. Even though we bounce, they keep pulling us in. And if we get closer, we get this great suction ground effect that uh, gives us a really, uh, really firm way to grasp the quantum surface. And then we can hang out there and, and do whatever we need to do. And then we take off. It actually, this is a little bit hard to take off because you have this suction effect. So if you catch yourself and force yourself to rotate away from the wall, then it's doable. Get away from the wall, so you have to actually set yourself in an unstable position in order to escape. Take a fly away and perch. Now, this one was in a post grip, so you could, you could perch on inverted surfaces as well. So you do that. And we thought this is great, it's much more reliable, it's a smaller control overhead, and the suspension design is much simpler because we didn't have to worry about absorbing this rebound as much as the rotors had done for us. And we thought this could potentially allow us to add another capability, which is we can climb, which is something we'd always wanted to do. Because while like I said initially it's easy to find a big flat surface to perch on, you're probably not going to end up exactly where you want it to be. So if you can climb, now you can position yourself accurately to maybe get a better signal on your antenna. And this is a lot more reliable than having to take off and re-perch. And it also works when it's windy or raining. So we thought this would be a, a useful capability for a quadrant to have. And since the suspension design was so much simpler, we could have something that was primarily a climbing mechanism and it would still work as a perching mechanism because we were perching primarily with aerodynamic control. And so this is the one note about climbing real quick before I talk about the results of that. Uh, we wanted a climbing robot that took nice long steps because the longer steps, the fewer steps it takes me to go up a meter the fewer chances I have to miss a step and fall. And it turns out that again, smaller creatures get better strength to weight ratios, and so you get these kind of daddy long legs legs that are very light, but that light have very long steps, very low mass cost. Now we don't, we're not quite as small as the daddy long legs, but the daddy long legs is have a carbon fiber, so we can do it, uh, and fewer steps for me. So, uh, this is the result of the, just play the video. This is scan, the Stanford climbing aerial delivery platform robot capable of flying, perching, climbing, recovering the failure, and taking off outdoors using only onboard sensing and commutation. To perch, scan flies until its tail contacts the wall. Unlike previous quadrotor perching strategies, which usually take place in carefully controlled laboratory environments, SCAN does not use a motion capture system or offboard computational resources, so it must detect the impact by using its onboard accelerometers. It responds by turning its rotors on its axis. The 
the tail acts as a pivot, forcing the robot into the correct orientation. The rotors then adhere the robot to the wall aerodynamically until the vibrations from the impact are dissipated and the speed about a good grip. The rotors can then be turned off and the scan can start to run. This mechanically assisted approach to purging is effective with a wide range of outcomes. Scan inclined by alternating loads between his two feet. The feet attach to bumps and pits on the wall using tiny metal spikes referred to as micro spots. These attach and pull down against the foothold and release when tension is removed. A conventional climbing robot doesn't have to carry the extra weight of a flying vehicle as it climbs. However, if such a robot misses a step and attaches from the wall, the results are usually suboptimal. From the other hand, the scan misses a step and starts to fall. It detects the drop in vertical acceleration and turns its rotors off briefly. This returns it to the wall where it can re-engage with the surface and resume climbing. The scan is ready to take off and deploys the takeoff spine. Without this takeoff spine, scan's rotors would keep the robot stuck to the climbing surface, unable to rotate without reversing thrust. Transferring the load to the spine applies a mechanical load that rotates scan away from the wall and allows it to fly away. So this was a really fun end of the <coughs> PhD treat to work with SCAMP. It ended up working really robustly. And we learned that putting these two different locomotion strategies together had costs. We had to carry around the flight mechanism while we flew. We had to carry a around with those of us when we climb. But it also gave us new capabilities and behaviors that we wouldn't have otherwise. And the first one was the one we started out with, which was one who said this flight. We actually measured the power drop the ground. And for hovering, it can only sustain that kind of load for three and a half minutes. Um, when it's climbing, it's much lower power drop behavior. It can climb for 20 minutes. And when it's just hanging out on the wall, the processor and the sensors actually draw a half a block, which there's no reason that they should, but they do. Um, I think it's because the designers of the crazy flight, they'd be hovering at 15 watts, so they didn't care. Um, and so it takes, it can, but it can still last for 105 minutes if you add a more reasonable, more reasonably efficient um, processor, then you could last for very much longer. If you turn it off, you can basically last indefinitely. Um, for the other, there are two other synergies for which I want to put in context of some operating regimes for SCAMP. So you have tail contact, foot contact, rotors on, rotors off. Um, these top two are very stable. This one is stable, but not quite as stable as this one. Uh, but it, because of tender mass flow, the foot attachment is in the same position. And this one is intentionally unstable. Um, so the first one is where we perch, you come in with the bottom and perch. This is where we're climbing. Uh, this is where we take off, where we intentionally create the stability attached here at the bottom, and the mass drags us away from the wall. And then, uh, when we've detached from the wall, and we're sort of bumping along, sometimes with the tail, sometimes with the foot, with the rotors on, that puts us in a recovery state, where we're actually going to be able to recover from the failure. Um, this was a unique ability that SCAMP had, uh, to, uh, compared to previous climbing robots, in that it could, it could detect when the vertical acceleration was not to go to zero, and it would turn on its rotors, and bring itself back in contact with the wall, and stop the fall, the rest of the descent. This was new for climbing robots, it was not new for climbing animals. So this is a, uh, an ant from a different rainforest, which has been dropped out of a tree by a malicious biologist. And the ant, if, if the ant hits the forest floor, the biologist will have effectively murdered it, because there are bigger ants down there that will eat it within three minutes on average. But if the ant can get back to the tree, it can return to its normal life. And so it's so small that just these little, just the legs, which aren't, which aren't optimized at all for having the behaviors, are able to give it some control authority as it goes to the air and it's able to direct itself back to the tree. And so we basically do the same thing where we're trying to direct ourselves back into the surface using a little bit of aerodynamic forces so that we don't have a catastrophic uh, Okay, one more thing if we look at this box, another thing we can do when we have, we're attached by our feet and we have the rotors on something we call rotor assisted climbing. To explain this, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, um, how we actually engage with the microspine. So if we zoom in on this little toe here, you'll see that the microspine is engaging with a little shelf-like structure on the, on the wall, a, micro, a microscopic shelf. That in, the order, in order for it to stick on the wall, the shelf has to be shallow enough that you, with just with friction, you can resist the tendency of the climb of the spine to want to pull away from the surface. So there's some pitch back moment you have to resist, so the shelf has to be shallow enough in order to resist that. 
But now, instead of being, instead of fishing back, okay. It's more, it's more, it's more robust to push up more. You'll have, you'll find you have less, you'll find you have less favor. So that's what we ended up doing. We, uh, <laughs> apply a little bit of thrust into the wall, and now all of a sudden you don't need as shallow of a shelf in order to engage with. In fact, pushing by just a quarter of your body weight is uh, is enough to increase the, the number of usable angles on this particular swept surface profile from three places where we need to expect to attach to two hangs. And so we basically get a lot more asparagus per centimeter, which could have implications for um, your efficiency of climbing and your reliability of climbing. And we verified this uh, by, <laughs> by dragging a spine at various loading angles across the surface with a little bit more or less uh, force pushing into the wall versus what we predicted based on an old surface trace of a cinder block. And we felt that this was uh, behaved as we expected it to. This is also something that we found in nature. So these are two car cartridges. They can fly up at 85 degrees if they so wish. But when they have the option to run up a pole, instead they do. And so they use their leg muscles to run up this uh, pole, and they use their wings to counteract the pitchback moment to, to, so that they don't have to, um, they're not pulling back from the wall they're pushing. So that uh, is the last contribution there to this perching strategy that enables us to do flying and climbing and all the implications that come out of that combining those two different strategies. And now we're going to crawl over the top and take a look going down the road. So in future work, I think we want to go back to those those trees that we were so scared of. And, and uh, I think um, Will also wants to land on giraffes. So there are more interesting services to engage with. Uh, we want to figure out what makes that hard and how we can mechanically turn on and make it easy. We're, I thought that this the use of contact mechanics becomes really important on these transitions. And so uh, evaluating how we do that intelligently and maybe even evaluating, right now we do it all passively um, with, the, with the, the tail, but maybe we can have some kind of active tail and you'd have to have sensors that are fast enough to detect these very quick contact impact events and then sense the actuators that could react to those. And uh, we are already getting to that with the quadro itself is more reactive and smaller, but there's other things, there's other interesting directions I think for that as well. Um, so these are the contributions we talked about. Uh, I'll put them in the context of some of the broader themes of this, which is that small robots move around the world differently. The world is different for them. Um, some of the solutions that they that they use when you become small involve a mix of both fluid and ground dynamics. Um, and for those, the transitions are very important. And they're often dominated by contact mechanics. So these are some of the broader lessons for how to move as a small robot. It's going to be different. You might want to think about using the fluid medium that you're surrounded by. You might want to think about using the ground for the ground, uh, the solid elements that you're flying past, and it's important to, to, to intelligently use the, the interaction with the surface. More generally, we've noticed a lot of natural inspirations throughout this presentation. Natural inspiration is a powerful tool, uh, especially because we're, nature has been working at small scales and in unstructured environments a lot longer than we have is in robotics. And so there's a large library of solutions that we should use. And just as a personal note, I feel like there's these animal analogs come especially naturally to the robots that we make because this they have this ability to move. And I think that when, some, when a machine can not only see the world and think about the world, but can actually engage with the world, that's when it kind of comes to life. And I feel like you get the, the and nature analogs come up because of this, because we're producing things that are more and more uh, like living things. And I think with the development of sensors and actuators and processors that have enabled us to have these things in our pockets will hopefully in the future enable us to have devices that not only do the sensing and computation, but actually reach back and touch us uh, and move us. And so uh, that's why something that gets me excited about robotics and something that I'm really happy about. Um, before I finish up, I would like to say thank you to Sadie Pope. <laughs> Cinnamon rolls, um, and I, 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 I'm not, I'd say it's one of them like that.
Um, I'd like to thank my, my professor, Mark, has given me a lot of freedom, and it's been just absolutely fantastic to work with. Um, I, I own it a lot, and it's been great to work in this lab. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing to have somebody who lets you do what you really want. Um, I'd like to thank the other members of the DML, especially the ones who work most closely with me, Alexi, who's passed on to Quebec, uh, Elliot, who <laughs> passed on to Santa Barbara, I think. Um, they were, these are my mentors, and Matt and Howard, the closest right behind me, that helped me with a lot of my research, and uh, it's been a treasure, a, a real treat to work with you. And recently, Will and Capella have come and helped a lot, and of course, there's my classmates, Hannah and Alice, and Joe Bobby's who's not here, but um, that have been with me throughout that cohort has been a, this has been a close fraternity and a bond. Uh, a lot of good Star Wars nights and a lot of good science. <laughs> um, uh, uh, my collaborators, I think Justin Thomas might be watching this later, and uh, Andrew Kamenbeck at UMD uh, were great to work with and we spent some long nights with them getting their uh, getting their motors to fly with my pieces strapped to the bottom. Um, and then of course I'd like to thank my parents. Um, Jane Law Ward, Marcus Pope, um, for making me exist and in more ways than just the physical one. And uh, my kids, who have been absolutely no help to the people, <laughs> uh, but have been very motivating in general, in the abstract. Uh, practically, practically not very helpful. And um, <laughs> I, my friends, I have two really good friends here today, one uh, for Washington Mobley, um, Mark, and Kieran, and Pete. Um, it's been great to make these relationships with Sandra. And, just, and uh, great to have Mary and Morris here too. Um, and we have a, have a great community here. We're very grateful for it. It uh, takes a village to raise a robot. Um, and I'd like to thank my thesis committee and uh, for showing up and for being here. Mark, it's the first time I've met you. I'm glad you're here. And, um, it's, I really appreciate you taking the time, especially this early on a Tuesday morning. And uh, that's it for today. Talk about um, you know all these sensors and computation getting smaller, and being able to really take advantage of that. Is there anything that you really wish was really small right now, mm. but uh, is not quite yet? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I wish that uh, I thought were small. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, we uh, well one thing that happened during my PhD, which I. Which I wish I had more time to explore was that time of flight laser range finders got much smaller. And so there are these nice time of flight laser range finders that are available now. And we have uh, Alexia had to use a much bigger one, using for two fixed wings. And the, the capabilities there, we just didn't get around to actually doing experiments with them, but I would really like to explore that. Um, I'm pretty satisfied with what processes are for most of the applications I'm doing. Uh, actuators were always pushing the actuators, but luckily I had Dave to help sift through all the hobby cake and find the ones that were high power density. So, um, but I, you know, hopefully this will be the thing of that. Yeah, are there any transitions? I was watching the robot kind of climb the wall here. Yeah, the transitions over the top, like around sides, or crawling, any other like mm -hmm. transitions? Uh, oh, be important for right. So, yeah, there is definitely like I think kind of macroscopic adjustment to surface angle is something that we'll need to look at in the future. So we noticed when we took we took sand onto a tree that uh, when the tree was relatively flat, it climbed really well. But when the tree went like this, sand would kind of come to the top and it reach for it and not find the next surface to grasp onto. So I think that's important. Um, You could, yeah, but I think we should. I, I know the first, I guess, is to maybe add some more actuation in now. We only have a minimal amount right now, but you can do more of it. And you know, you can take a very small step and move as far as far as you can. Um, but there's also some limitation on that. And that kind of, I think, for more maneuverable, especially for that case, you might actually want shorter stride lengths so that you can have a shorter robot in general. Uh, so you, you mentioned briefly about 
using the robot itself that has been an action here. Um, so you can get your contact with Ken, you can get your appliance and serve course to it. Um, any thoughts on how that scales with size, maybe the speed of the inputs you're able to apply to here? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So it's it's basically as your as your quadrant gets smaller, your ability to move in the uh, your your gross ability to move like straight up yeah. is relatively constant. But your ability to control how you change your orientation actually gets a lot better because again it's inertia the torque scaling factor. So you can have much faster um, reactions to to external services as you get smaller. So force that you increase bandwidth that you still have. Yeah, basically. So yeah, you, you're you're right. You're as a small wire, you're not gonna be able to pick up as much, but um, you're able to be much more maneuverable, which is why it kind of makes sense for a smaller vehicle to be less about um, doing physical work and more about moving itself to different places to do interesting things. Unless you have a nice way to attach to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It seems like a battery life is a, is a big concern for practical applications. Um, you may not have looked at it too much in just getting a single person client, but. Um, What's your gut on like how big of a battery you can get on something about the size, or where, mm -hmm. where would you go with that in the future? Sure. So I mean, the there are some research projects to try and make like little uh, maybe heat engines using gasoline, which would be really interesting. Um, you can get like if you really strip down everything and you get a huge old battery, then there are quad rotor flight times. These are for bigger cars about a meter scale that I've seen on the internet two or three hours from the hobbyists, which is impressive. Um, and it's basically just motors and the enormous battery and nothing else. And it stays one spot and covers for two hours. Which is cool. <laughs> um, there was there were some some people thought about putting uh, making a hydrogen powered quad rotor or hydrogen or helium powered, so you would have the medium itself would be lighter than air. So you would have the, the volume of the quad rotor taken up by the fuel. So it would be a little bit lighter and the fuel is high density. Um, so I think that it's an important question. And I think, you know, ultimately it's not impossible. I mean, animals use gas. Animals are powered by fat, which is the moral equivalent of gasoline. And uh, they're able to do it with these little tiny actuators even all the way down to the size of an ant. So it's not inconceivable that you can make a small robot that's powered by something that actually has reasonable chemical energy density. We just have to figure out how to do it. All right, thank you very much. All right, well, I think I have to kick all uh, you nice people out. <laughs> and uh, say goodbye to this as well. Thanks, everybody.